Good evening. I'll call this meeting of the Johnson City Board of Commissioners for Thursday, March 22nd, 2018 to order. Uh, we'll begin with the invocation by Pastor Rob Lechner from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and uh, then we'll have the pledge. So please rise and stay risen for the pledge. Mr. Mayor, thank you for this opportunity. And before I pray, I'm just reminded of the reason we come and pray for you. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father God in heaven, in order that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in our community, and that all people may come to the knowledge of godliness and holiness, I pray for our local government leaders here this evening, those that you have placed in authority, I lift up to you this evening, Mayor Tamita, Vice Mayor Jenny Brock, Commissioners Fowler, Van Brocklin, and Weiss. And so I pray that you'll give these in authority wisdom in every decision and help them to think clearly, guide their tongues, and that their, may, their speech may be edifying. Grant them discernment and common sense so they'll be strong, effective leaders. Help them to lead and govern with integrity, and may their integrity guide them and keep them on track. Be merciful to give us leaders who are spirit-filled and follow your principles. Direct their steps tonight according to your word, for their decisions have a great impact on our lives in this community. Be their defender and protector and keep them always on guard and help those who are Christians to be strong and courageous, standing firm in their faith and influence others for your kingdom. Encourage and strengthen them, giving them wisdom that they need to help and, and courage and faith in you, no matter what they face from day to day. And so, Father, we thank you as we invite you into this chamber tonight, and we pray for your leading in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Very good, uh, Mr. Peterson. Before we start, I would like to welcome Mike Stutz from ETSU and his uh, class from the College of Public Health, which uh, I think you account for the majority of the people in this room. So uh, we will try not to bore you, but thanks for coming. Mr. Peterson. First order of business is consideration of the minutes of the meeting held on Thursday, March the 1st. Do we have any comments, corrections, additions, edits? How about a motion? We've got a motion. How about a second? Second. Motion a second. Ms. Jennings? Mr. Fowler. Yes. Mr. Van Brock. Yes. Mr. Wise. Yes. Mr. Mayor Brock. Yes. Mayor Yes. Next order of business is proclamations, resolutions, and presentations. The first being the presentation of a proclamation recognizing Rowan Benton. Rowan, we, uh, we read about you, we're very proud of you, and we wanted to come in and celebrate your accomplishments. So we have a proclamation for you. Whereas Rowan Benton is a student at Liberty Bell Middle School, and whereas Rowan has cerebral palsy and apraxia limiting his motor skills, but that did not stop him from hitting, hitting the slopes and learning how to ski. And whereas skiing became more than just a hobby, and whereas 
Rowan worked hard to master his skill of skiing and was soon able to ski unassisted by holding onto a ski pole for balance. It's better than I can do. <laughs> and whereas, Rowan was the first competitor from the Washington County area to participate in the Winter Special Olympics held in Obergatlinburg in January, earning not one, but two gold medals in skiing events. Now therefore, I, David Tamita, Mayor of the City of Johnson City, do hereby congratulate Rowan Benton on a remarkable accomplishment during the Winter Spring Olympics, which he successfully and admirably represented our community. We are proud of you. If you'd like to say anything, you can, or I, I bet you I see somebody here who might say a word. Well, this is unexpected to say a word or two. Thank you, David. Um, we are very proud of Rowan, and uh, his mom was coach uh, for this area, and Caroline was also a coach. And so we're very proud of um, the whole family, as well as Ginger, who's the special education director here in Johnson City Schools. Well, thank you. We're very proud. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And Caroline, I'd like Caroline to say a word. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to say that Rowan is my best friend, and I'm very proud of him. And your gift is you do not have to stay. <laughs> All right, your next order of business is uh, the presentation of a proclamation recognizing public procurement month. Debbie, if you'd come forward, and Valerie, come on up, ladies. Good evening. I just saw you earlier today, didn't I? Well, we're going to celebrate Public Procurement Month, whereas public procurement function supports a multitude of services provided by all government agencies across Tennessee, including the city of Johnson City, and whereas public procurement professionals dedicate themselves to serving the best interests of the community as custodians of the public trust, public service, and justice to ensure accountability, impartiality, ethics, and professionalism. And whereas public procurement has tremendous influence on the economic conditions within our community through a team effort and cooperation of the city's elected and appointed officials, department heads, department purchasing agents, purchasing staff, and the vendor community. <coughs> and whereas the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing, NIGP, has designated this month of March to inform the public about the importance of the critical role that public procurement plays a lot of alliteration here yeah, like <laughs> in our community <laughs> success. Now therefore, I, David Tamita, Mayor of the City of Johnson City, Tennessee, do hereby proclaim March 2018 as Public Procurement Month in Johnson City, Tennessee, and encourage all citizens to join the National Institute of Governmental Purchasing in this worthy observance. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, public purchasing has become more than just buying stuff. It's become pretty complex. There are a lot of ever-changing rules, regulations, laws. And this department, this full staff right here of three, spends about $55 million worth of goods and services for the city. And more than ever, I, what this proclamation is really saying is that it's very important to have a trained professional procurement staff. And I can assure you one thing. Johnson City's Purchasing Department are very good stewards with the taxpayers' dollars. So thank you. Thank you. Good job, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it. <laughs> that's all of them. De Debbie, Debbie recognized that they spend over fifty-five million dollars. What? she didn't say was there's probably 150 different individuals within the organization that those three ladies interact with on a daily basis not only to make sure that it's proper it's legal it's ethical and it's right but they review bid specs they put bid specs together they try to coach employees how to do things the right way the most efficient way 
And we are very blessed to have those three young ladies right there help us do all they do every day. They, uh, it's some of the unsung heroes. The ladies, thank you. And at this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Jack Dempsey and his anybody else you want to bring with you, Jack, forward to, to recognize present uh, a resolution recognizing Mr. Dempsey. Well, Jack, I don't know how we're gonna how we're gonna make it without you. Although you did you did leave Johnson City, we we forgive you because you cover well, us well. Back. You came back, um, and I didn't know you were from Ashland, Kentucky. I lived in Ashland, Kentucky. So, well, how about that? So we have something in common. We did. Aside from looking alike. Right. <laughs> so, retirement of Jack D. Dempsey. Whereas Jack D. Dempsey was born and raised in Ashland, Kentucky. And whereas Dempsey began his broadcasting career with WAXU AM in Georgetown, Kentucky in 1973, later starting his television career with WKYT TV in Lexington, Kentucky. And whereas, Dempsey joined WJHL TV in Johnson City, Tennessee, where he served as general manager for 23 years until joining Sinclair Broadcasting, WCYB, in 2012, serving as vice president and general manager. And whereas, he was a true volunteer throughout his community and past president of the Rotary Club of Bristol, a past member of the Barter Theater's Board of Directors, and is currently serving on the board for the United Way of Bristol. Now, therefore, be it resolved that members of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Johnson City, Tennessee, upon his retirement on March 30th, 2018, do hereby officially commend Jack D. Dempsey for the serv service to this community, and be it further resolved that this commission uh, resolution be spread upon the official minutes of this meeting. Stranger to a TV camera. Are you sure you want to hand a microphone to a broadcaster? <laughs> I mean, this could get out of hand quickly. No. Uh, um, thank you all so much. I appreciate this. You know, it's uh, hard to believe that uh, 30, about 32 years and five months ago was when I came to Johnson City. And uh, I'd heard all kinds of things about it being a haven for Al Capone and all these things. <laughs> but when I got here, it was didn't take but about five minutes to... Uh, get acclimated to everything. It's a marvelous community and uh, I'm proud to be a part of it and I'm particularly proud of this and I thank all of you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Next order of business is consideration of a beer license application for the Roots Vietnamese Restaurant, LLC, located at 600 North State of Franklin Road, Suite 1. This is for a Class 1 on-premise license. The appropriate re uh, reviews and reports have been made, and the recommendation is for approval. Very good. Is the applicant here tonight? Would you come, come forward, please? And to state your name and address for the record. Uh, B.B. Nguyen, 600 North State of Franklin, Suite 1, Johnson City, Tennessee, 37604. Very good. And have you read the rules and regulations yes, regarding the sale of beer in the city of Johnson City? Yes. Do you have a, a, agree to abide by those rules? Yes. Do you have any questions for us? Um, I do not. No. Do I have approval? Second. I guess we have no questions for you. We have a motion and a second. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ms. Jennings, call the roll, please. Yes. Mr. Van Brock, yes. 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 Congratulations. And if you'd like to take a minute and tell us about your business, uh, get a little free advertising. Yeah, of course. Um, so my family and I relocated here from San Diego, California um, just last year, um, about February 2017. Opened the business in April 1st, and we're approaching our one year. So this is a great uh, way to introduce a new set of item in our restaurant. Um, Vietnamese restaurant, mother's been in the restaurant industry for over 30 years, so home cooked meals, everything from scratch. Um, so hope to see you all there to enjoy some authentic ethnic food. And where exactly is it? Um, 600 North State of Franklin, right next to the sound room where the old cranberries used to be. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good thank luck. You so thank you. Yep. Yep. Your next order of business is consideration of a temporary occasion license for the Chamber of Commerce Foundation. 
for an event to be held on April the 28th, 2018, and the uh, recommendations for approval. Good evening. If you Good evening. How are you? Your name and address for the record. Please. Yes, uh, Gary Mabry, uh, chamber address is 603 East Market Street, Johnson City, Tennessee, 37605, just across the street. And have you read the rules and regulations regarding uh, the sale of We have certainly uh, <laughs> want to abide by those and invite all of you to come to the first annual Boss of the Toss. It will be a cornhole tournament that we will conduct in Founders Park on the 28th day of Saturday. So, you know, if you're a left-hander or a right-hander or a both-hander, we'll look forward to having you there for a five hours of fun. Some prizes, uh, we're going to use that to support some foundation programs with the Chamber as well as Second Harvest Food Bank. It's being done by our Leadership 20. 20 program and some of you and have been extremely uh, active in that program over the years. So look forward to having you there. Well, that good. is if you approve this. <laughs> well, you already answered the questions I was going to ask. So oh, okay. I guess do we have any more questions for? Move for approval. We have a motion. Second. Motion to second. Any uh, further discussion? Ms. Jennings, call the roll. Mr. Fowler. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you, Mayor. Thank good you luck. all. Have a good day. Happy Easter. Happy Thank Easter. You. Next order of business is to make four appointments to the Board of Dwellings and Standards Review. Uh, in your packet is the list of applicants and information about the board. I would uh, like to share with you that Daniel Burks has asked that his application be withdrawn from consideration. So that only leads us with three applicants for four positions, is that correct? That is correct we would um, re-advertise for the fourth position. Very good. Well, that's kind of simple, right? <laughs> that being um, the case, I'd like to nominate uh, Charles Spencer, Teresa McAdams, and David Jenny for three of the four positions. I will second that, and at the same time, I'd like to say, um, and I think all of us on the commission really realize how effective this board is. Um, they've done an incredible job, and I think we're going to be very pleased to have Mr. Jenny on that because he comes in with a great deal of experience uh, to help with that as well. So I second that. I'd, I'd like to make a comment along those same lines. Uh, over the years that I've been on the commission, I've had the opportunity to sit through a lot of meetings of this board, and I've seen uh, Mr. Jenny in particular involved with the actions of this group and really promoting a much safer and a much more aesthetic uh, city environment. We appreciate your past attempts at this. We appreciate your interest in being on the board. I'm glad you reapplied. I have the opportunity to vote for you this evening. Uh, beyond that, the other two candidates uh, have been on this, this board for a long time. They've been extremely effective. This board has grown by leaps and bounds as far as their effectiveness over the, the seven or eight years that I've been on this commission. So I certainly can highly compliment uh, Mike Sluter and Teresa McAdams for, uh, for their efforts. Any other comments? Uh, did we get a second? Okay. Well, this Jennings call the roll. Mr. Fowler. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Your next item for consideration is the consent agenda. All right. Right to left. Anything uh, anybody would like to pull? No. I'm sorry. You're right. Commissioner Wise. I'm sorry. You're the yeah. far right. Uh -huh. my, my right. You're right. Left, what? Right. Yeah. No, I'm right. getting the, the sound room is telling me that my microphone is making noise, and so I was distracted by the <laughs> noise. Sorry. I'm back. Welcome. Anything you'd like to pull for consideration? No, sir. All right. I'd like to pull A9, please. Okay. A9. Mr. Fowler. A12, please. And Vice Mayor Brock. Uh, no, I am good with that. Uh, okay, A9 okay. uh -huh. is consider approval for condemnation for tracks 16 and 17A on the Knob Creek Road CSX Railroad Overpass project. I had some questions about the way that this was being approached 
being considerably different than what we typically see, and I know staff was looking at that to come back to us with some commentary regarding that and, and, and let us know whether or not that still remained their recommendation for how we approach this. Uh, it actually is a recommendation from the property owner himself. Uh, he did not want to settle. Uh, there is a difference of opinion um, um, in his discussions with his team. Uh, there was, they feel that there may be a discrepancy on damages and they feel that their property is worth more. So their preference was to wait until after the project's built before they wanted to settle. So I can't, we can't move without the condemnation. So it's, it's essentially a friendly condemnation. Does that process make sense for us, both from the standpoint of timing and from the standpoint of potential liability to us at some point as far as what we end up paying? Um, it's up to the courts as to um, what the payment's going to be. As far as timing, it is very beneficial to us so that we can get the uh, right of way uh, wrapped up by this summer so that we can move on with the project. Staff doesn't have any opinion about uh, whether or not we're likely to end up spending more by delaying it as opposed to the same amount or less. We can't move. He doesn't want to settle. Today. I'm aware of that, but I'm talking about ultimately. Ultimately, um, uh, when you have discrepancies, it again, it goes to the court, so it's hard to know exactly how the courts are going to um, uh, adjudicate the issue. If he feels his property is worth $1.1 .1 and we feel it's worth $700, uh, there is definitely a difference of opinion that we cannot marry those two numbers together today. So um, are the differences, the difference between what we say and what he's saying are so significant that you could not overcome it with Right, and I don't think, I don't imagine that that dynamic will change. What I would hope though is that as that road is built, and if we delay this and he come and, and we then have to condemn and the courts look at what that road looks like pretty close to his house that it doesn't end up ultimately costing us more money by delaying Good. and going through this process that would be an opinion based on the time of the appraisal it could okay you feel then i, I guess i'll just summarize it this way you feel that it's more in our interest to go ahead and take this alternate approach so that we can move forward on the project than to approach it in the typical fashion that we would where we can't come to an arrangement but between we did, ourselves and we the did owner. do it in the typical fashion and tried to negotiate in his preference I know but I'm talking about negotiate. the typical fashion if we have to condemn where it's done on the front end and not after the fact the condemnation will occur on the front end so that we deposit what we believe the value of the property is into the courts so that it sits there. If he wants to settle, he can take the money and go. If he wants to wait, then he waits and that money earns interest or whatever. But we will be writing a check for what we believe to be the value that goes into the court system in order to acquire the property today with the case to be settled sometime in the future. And his preference was to, he, he, he wanted to settle after the road is built. So that could be but, sometime. But typically, the typical situation that would not occur. That does occur. Um, after when the there is a Well, we had one on, uh, for example, the access road to the VA. We had, um, and, and that case is yet to be resolved. We had one um, on uh, when we built University Parkway. That case probably took seven, eight years. Um, that it's not uncommon for it to.
drag out for a period of time. It's, it's not uncommon in the condemnations. It's up to how quickly the lawyers can get together, how quickly they can, and that pretty much is up to them. I think what, not to put words in Commissioner Van Brocklin's mouth, but what is unusual about this that I don't ever recall us doing this before is we usually proceed with condemnation and then the court settles it whenever the court settles it. I don't ever remember us agreeing on the very front end saying, yeah, we're going to wait until after the project's completed. That I think that's <coughs> what Commissioner Van Brocklin's referring well, to. Right. This is a little unusual. Well, that's... Yeah. Again, that's his preference, well, it, and, and we, it'll be up to his We know that's people. his preference, but do, do we have to abide by his preference? Can we not well, go I, ahead and adjudicate? I think why we're condemning him. Yeah, I, I, maybe. Can I ask a question? Because I think we're kind of talking past each other. Yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, correct me if I'm wrong, and Jim Epps may be the one to speak to this. When we condemn it, we put the appraised value into the court. The court holds that money. He can go in there the day after we do that, take it, and walk away. Or he can continue to play out this, I want to see what it's going to be worth in however many years when it's built, the road is built. In the meantime, the, is the, so to give, what, describe the access, because that's the part I'm interested in. <laughs> Straighten this out. We bring suit. We pay money in. He can take the money and still say it's not enough and contest it. We get possession of the property, and the only way we can get possession in this case is by bringing suit. Now, he can wait, and he has the right under statute to wait once we bring suit until the project is complete. He has that right. We can't stop that. That's under the condemnation laws. So he can bring, he can take the money out immediately and still say it wasn't enough and then have a jury decide what is. Could we do a jury trial prior to condemnation? No. No. Because that's part of the law. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the variable here isn't that we're doing anything different. The variable here is the landowner is going about arriving at this number in a way that's unusual in, in terms of the way we normally get right of way. This seems to be a normal condemnation to me. I've represented property owners in condemnations, and I've represented the city in condemnations. And there have been times when I've, when my client, being a property owner, has said, I want to wait and see what happens. And so we do. And then the project gets complete. You get to see everything that happens. And um, then you go to trial. Or you settle. I appreciate the explanation. I think I misunderstood. Um, you know, I thought that this would uh, be able to be settled before the road was built. It sounds like he has the right and the opportunity to do exactly what he's asking to do, whether we want him to or not. My big concern is that we don't end up spending more money as we wait. It sounds like we really have no opportunity to impact that, in the, uh, if, I, if I'm understanding what you're right. saying. You set a fair market value. We pay it into right. court. He takes the money, and then he says, it's not enough. He gets appraisers. They go into court. They say what it's worth. You, we you do. tell me what I need to know. And there's there's no point even continuing yeah. to discuss it. Because <laughs> no, right. apparently, it doesn't matter. But he's, he's hedging down the road. The value is going to be greater. That's exactly No, the saying. value is ascertained at the moment of possession of okay, the property. Okay, and the courts will see it at that time. Right. Okay. It, it is not, you know, we don't, it's, it's when we take possession of it is when the value, the courts will say that is the point okay. in which the value is. Our appraisers get as close to that time as they can, and then we... Because having a bridge over your house probably is not a value in Hampshire, right? I mean, unless you're. I'm, I can't comment on <laughs> on the case. Right. All right, and I think it's also important. This is a project that is not funded. All right. So what what if we were to wait it out a little while? What would we be holding up? That's probably one for Phil. That's that's a good and that was one of my questions. Yeah. We talked about Monday night. If okay. you could just give us an update, because yeah. we've had a little bit of. Uh, publicity in the paper about the project and set some expectations for our citizens. Get me on this thing. 
wanted to go through the project real quick. <laughs> I don't know how to get on. If you're asking us. Uh, Ralph, can you go and get his PowerPoint? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Would you take your smartphone down? And... Okay, there you go. Uh, and, and what I'm going to do is just describe the, the project and the public purpose behind the project, and then I'm going to kind of give an idea of where we are financially so that the public knows, because I know there's been some discussion about it. Um, this is the project. It extends from this is State of Franklin on the right side, and we have across the street John City Crossing. You have um, Lowe's. Uh, coals and that sort of thing. This section of roadway is already five lane. So we're going to take Knob Creek and run a five lane up to Mountain View. When you get to Mountain View today, people would, to get across the railroad track, they take a left turn and then go through a one lane tunnel. What we're going to do is actually extend it straight over the railroad tracks with a five lane roadway over the railroad tracks with a bridge and tie back in to roughly um, this is Mizpah Hill subdivision and this is Stone Ridge subdivision so at the top of the hill where Stone Ridge is is where this project ties in so um, in order to do that we have to readjust Claude Simmons Road which extends to this point today so if you were coming down Claude Simmons from Strawberry Fields, et cetera, you would actually just continue up the existing Knob Creek, and then we have to do a tie-in at this location. That would be signalized. Uh, there will be, uh, we're designing it for double left turn movements off of um, uh, Knob Creek, and uh, that will facilitate traffic. So it would be a much safer, It'll handle much more traffic than, than current, is the current condition. That's the number one objective of this project. Um, number two is that in the design of a community, in a transportation system, the most efficient form is uh, what we refer to as spoken wheel. For example, 285 that goes around Atlanta, I think Charlotte has it. All the major centers have, have the wheels that rotate around the community. And then the spokes are the roads that tie between those wheels or feed into a central business district. So those are very common in some of the larger communities. What that is is the most efficient and effective form of transportation that a community should pursue uh, wherever possible and practical. And that's what we're doing here. So if I go to the next sheet, that's what this looks like. What we're doing is this is Boone's Creek Road. Uh, that will be eventually five lanes. Uh, here's the interstate uh, here. And then we have Market Street here. And then Jonesboro is down in this area. Uh, that is pretty much a subset of the of the metropolitan area. So you have this wheel, if you will, uh, of the Jonesboro or the Boone's Creek Road. What we're trying to do is we know that there is in Boone's Creek about a billion and a half dollars of investment potential based on the number of vacant acreage. That's why the county made a decision to build a school right in the middle of it, which I think is a great idea. And um, so that billion and a half investment, part commercial, um, part uh, residential, a lot of activity, it's a high growth area. So what we're trying to do is create a, a, a spoke, if you will, so that the traffic doesn't have to go all the way to the interstate and then come back down into the activity centers of John City Crossings, uh, the hospital, uh, that sort of thing. And so this becomes a spoke. And so what's in blue is the project that I just showed you. 
And what's in yellow is a project that we're working with with the county um, uh, to look at upgrading that road to a super two and, and turn movements and design it in such a way that can easily handle 15,000 or so vehicles a day. We believe this is a critical element to the growth of the community as well as promoting proper land use and a proper transportation system. The third objective, if I go back to this, is notice around what we're building, there is 120 acres of vacant land on this side of the railroad tracks. What typically, uh, and we're right at the corridor, uh, right in the corridor of the crossings, that commercial area. The typical rule of thumb is that as you develop, it's valued at about a uh, million dollars per acre after development. So you got 120 acres and that's 120 millions of, million of potential investment. If you look at the tax rate and you take 120 million, if that were to, to come about, then the property taxes off of that 120 acres would be roughly $2 million a year. So the $2 million, uh, if you take, because property taxes represent 1.6% of, of the value of your home, I'm not even talking about sales tax. I'm not talking about jobs and all that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about property values. So, so now we're talking about creating an economic impact for the community. Sometimes you do it, the, the local governments do it um, at the time developments occur or want to occur and we talk about all that. I've been involved with every one of them for the last 40 years or so. The, um, in this particular case, you are, you are designing a system to create the atmosphere of future economic development. So those are the three primary reasons why this is a great project, one that should be high priority for both parties. Now remember I did mention to you that the property taxes generated are both city and county. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, it matters when I'm a homeowner. Um, if I pay city and county, I'm paying to the government. So look at it in terms of the government, and it just happens that we have two parties involved in the project. Well, here's a cost breakdown of the project. The design, uh, we received uh, this money um, as a demo uh, of federal monies, a special legislation by the United States government. So it's covered at 100%. Right away, which is what we're in, which sometimes requires the public, because of the public need of the project, to have to condemn if you can't come to an agreement between the two parties. That's what the whole system's about. Uh, we estimate that we're around 5.4 million for the right of way. We're about 60% through that and we're drawing monies down. Well, that money is 80% federal and 20% local. We have an agreement with the state of Tennessee, Washington County, and the city, a joint agreement in which the 20% share is split in half between the city and the county. So we pay 10%, the county pays 10%. So 10% of 5.4 million is roughly 540,000 local dollars to each unit of government. So by the summer, whether through condemnation or through purchases, which we believe that the bulk will be from straight up purchases, um, we will have all the right of way. We're ready for construction. Well, now the question is, well, where are we with the monies needed to build the $18.5 million project. Well, we already have 80 or $6.5 million of STP monies, the federal monies, which is an 
So what we're looking for is the difference between 18 and a half and six and a half, which is about $12 million. So there will be decisions to be made as to how to share in that cost. Uh, we have reason, we have some discussions with TDOT that there may be opportunities to cut that obligation of the additional monies of 12 million in half, uh, but we have to pursue that. Uh, we have every reason to believe um, the county's in for whatever share of the half um, um, in order to facilitate all of the public need as first described in this presentation. So we're $12 million apart, and that's the discussion that will take place with TDOT, with the county. The other part of that is that the uh, state legislature, and the reason we believe pretty strongly that the state's going to come through for us, at least uh, possibly in, for half that $12 million, <coughs> they have legislation that was passed that put Knob Creek Road essentially on the state route system. And that would be Knob Creek from Boone's Creek to Mizpah Hills. And they would earmark to build the roadway in the future. But what they have uh, suggested to the two parties is an equal share um, or we've discussed an equal share in the design element of that roadway in order to try to speed that element of the entire project up by a few years. <coughs> and the state has indicated that that type of participation helps them to prioritize the construction of the roadway so that you could move things forward. If that were to occur, um, then you would tack on a little bit more into, you, you, instead of needing 18.5, you would need probably 19.5 or some such, some such number. Um, that's where we stand uh, with the entire project. That's the need. I think it's a great need. I think it's a well-designed, um, efficient transportation network. It promotes good land use development. Uh, it supports growth. It encourages growth. So, okay. So my my original question <laughs> was, and I appreciate the appreciate the uh, information, but my original question is, what from a timeline standpoint? This is not what whatever you might be expecting out of Nashville ain't happening this this session, right? So we're looking into 2019 for that, correct? The quickest at, that you could anticipate, quickest. the quickest yeah. you could anticipate, the very quickest would be um, um, a letting of the project in the spring of 2019. If that additional funding is? If the additional funding is there or the two governments decide to, to split the difference on the 12 million or get supplemental funding from TDOT. Yeah. Well, uh, just for the benefit of the public, why don't you explain what STP funds are? And then the second thing, will this project be driven by TDOT or will it be driven locally once construction starts? The um, project uh, at Indian Ridge in the state of Franklin uses STP monies and the city manages the project through that phase. It is assumed, uh, and I don't know the attachments to any other uh, TDOT program, uh, it would be assumed that we would be managing the project following the same guidelines that we followed on the Indian Ridge, getting a CEI inspector in and doing all the rest. Um, so managing it, now if there other program that they're looking at requires them to do something different that's that's great and we have a project like that which is the Lark Street extension that is we uh, we understand will be bid in May 
Well, on that project, we managed up to the construction. Then TDOT will manage everything after the construction. So we're out. Uh, but in uh, this particular case, it's anticipated that we would do the same thing as we did on Indian Ridge. But the STP funds include federal money. Is okay. that correct? Yeah. When the federal government is allocating out their big pot of money, um, they will send portions to the state, and then there are portions that are allocated, I, I would think, by population, but I don't know that for an absolute fact. There are portions that are allocated to metropolitan areas, of which we in the county, I think it's Unicoi and Carter, um, is, a, is a metropolitan area. Kingsport and Hawkins County, I think, is the other one up here. So there are two of them. And there is an annual contribution of about $1.7 million a year. Now, this $6.5 million takes you through October of this year. If the federal government approves continuation of funding beyond that, which we have no reason to believe they won't, then you could actually tack on each year another one and a half or so million dollars at the current rate. Yeah, but that's so, strictly dependent on us not using those funds for other things, which we've been doing. You have been doing that. That's correct. So you used uh, STP. Um, you have used it on other projects. That's correct. So uh, you indicated with this $12 million gap, there was a potential for $6 million of that, half of that, to be covered by state or federal? What? Uh, I'm not sure what pot of money the state takes it at. They, we just look at it as the state. Mm -hmm. It's an interstate connector type of funding, so I would assume that they get an allocation, then they just mix and match the, the allocation that they get. Uh, from the feds and maximize the use of their state monies. The gas tax is the state money at, uh, what is it, 30 million per penny, um, and then the federal government allocates so much. What I, conversation, I yeah, what conversation have we had that would give us hope that, in fact, that might come through? I met with Mr. Deggs at TDOT last week when I was down there. Uh, I was down there with uh, some folks from the county as well, and we talked about our section of this project and the other section that is part of the the improve or yeah the improve act, which it is law that it is on it is recognized as a road that the state of Tennessee will build, and that's the section from uh, Boone's Creek Road back to Ms. Paw Hills. It's so outlined in yellow. Yeah, the section. You know, we, we were talking about timing on that and how that project could be expedited. TDOT's doing this on a cash basis, obviously. So projects that are already ahead of this one will get a, a, the first priority as they work off their funding. And the, the conversation around this particular road section dealt around how could we expedite this, and it was suggested that uh, – it would probably expedite the construction time of that if the locals would participate uh, through the engineering, for example. That could move that construction project up two, three, four, or five years in order to but, get it moving. And but, then on but what our stretch, end, what stretch road is that? Is that your yellow stretch? That's the or yellow. Is that that's blue? the yellow okay. stretch. The red, the blue stretch. The, the six million dollars. Then is that? For the yellow stretch, or is that for the blue stretch? Because which what, what it's for what the blue might, stretch. How how is it that us participating on the yellow stretch I'm, is going to I, potentially I was, get us an additional there. six there? <laughs> I, I'm I'm getting there. Okay. The rest of the conversation centered around: was there any way to get the state involved in the current project that we're working on? And the response was yes. There were some funding options out there that this could be eligible for state funding on a 50-50 match. Uh, so, what what we're laying out here tonight is here's the small piece that we're looking at. There is hope for some state funding for the section we're currently working on, and the and the further explanation that the project as a whole 
with some cooperation between the two local governments and the state, there's a hope of expediting the outlying piece of this as well as far and in addition to getting state funding for the project we currently have underway. When will we have knowledge about that potential additional $6 million? Uh, probably not before uh, 10 to 12 months, the earliest. It's, it's going to be after the first of the year in 2019 before we would have a, an answer on that. So what is the amount that the local governments, they want to see us, you know, put up some capital money for this project? What are we looking at? And the, the local project that we are currently working on, the funding availability that we could be possibly eligible for requires a 50-50 match. So if we've got a $12 million shortfall after the STP, then you just work backwards as to, you know, who, who participates and to what degree they're going to participate. And as Phil pointed out, there is an existing agreement between the three parties that the county would participate in the construction or in the development of this section. Back out of that, is that $3 million or $6 million or $3 million? Three million well, if, you, if yeah. we put up six and a half and the state matched that with six and a half, then you see, you know, you've got a, a shortfall of, of six. We would be at uh, roughly 1.2. Plus, uh, if you split the 12, let's just say it was 12, then our cost would be that 3 million plus what we've already obligated to, which would be 1.2. So that'd be your max obligation for us and the same amount for the county. All right, so we're basically doing what people do when they decide what they're going to do when they win the lottery, right? I mean, we, <laughs> no, so we don't, I think we don't this, know. I think we this is know. pretty yeah. solid future yeah. planning yeah. to yeah. put funding into place to save us local dollars. I, yeah. This is what you pay us to do is go find funding. Well, and I think it's safe to say that projects don't always begin with clarity of every successive step defined at the outset. So we can do right-of-way acquisition you're not going to build this bridge without the right of way and you're and you're not going to get that project funded if the funding source looks at it and says well you're four years away from even being able to spend any of the money we're talking about allocating and so I mean, this is critically needed I mean you, you get out there at certain times in the day and the traffic backs up to Mountain View and I mean it, it for those who know this area, it's a need. I think the important takeaway for the public is when you see us moving forward on condemning properties for right of way, that doesn't mean you're going to see, you know, heavy machinery out there doing something exciting anytime in the next two years. But but it is just one step in a long process. And I want to say for our students here, I am so glad you're here tonight because usually our meetings are so boring. It's like watching grass grow and you're here for a good one. Uh, <laughs> they're going, oh my gosh, really? Yeah, this, yeah it really is. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that we're doing the right of way acquisition. We are in the midst of that. Uh, I was just curious as to, it, it looks like we're 10 to 12 months away from the next step how critical is it that we move forward on the condemnation now? I guess that that was my only question 30 minutes ago. <laughs> that that was my question. Um, and what well, do we if you stop? What do we slow down if we don't move forward today? If I mean, you, I'm not if you that stop we between phases in the middle of a phase, Thanks, you have to pay it back. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're moving from one phase to the next phase. So we're committed to finishing the right of way phase. If we don't finish the right-of-way phase and choose not to do it, then we have to return all the money. And I, again, don't don't answer what I didn't ask. I'm not I'm not suggesting we don't complete it. I'm just saying, is there an urgency to move forward with the condemnation? And this is a yes or no question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Peterson, uh, so if we we're going into a phase of really trying to acquire the funding for this project, how long do you think that's going to take? I think uh, 12 months from now, we'll know if we have state participation. And uh, I mean, this this road project is uh, has been in our CIP for a while, and we're we're building 
operating budget and future operating budgets, recognizing that there's going to be a debt issuance to cover Johnson City's portion of this project. So if if we can uh, uh, receive some state funding, then that just lessens the burden on us locally and frees up some money. So I, I would think this time next year, we're going to have to to make a bu an operating budget decision to to as to when we would start construction on the project. So our our message to the public who are inquiring want to know that within the next 12 months they're not going to see any construction or anything out there, but we should know in the next 12 months when that will occur. I think that's a right. I think it's fair okay statement. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. That yep. was really a good presentation of that project, and I agree with the Commissioner Wise. This is not only much needed, but the economic development opportunities are, are significant for our area. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next. 12. All right, on, on 12. Um, we have a project coming up to build a new gym and cafeteria. And we talked about this Monday night, but uh, we're going to retain someone to kind of have oversight of this. And we talked about it in the meeting, whether we just pick somebody or whether we go through a process to see who we want to run this project. And I just wanted to hear the discussion tonight, too, on what everybody thought. Well, when I, I'll just go ahead and weigh in on this. When I first got on the commission in 2013, we were doing a lot of construction at that time um, with the schools, and we decided to hire, and we chose um, uh, Burleson Construction to be our owner's representative. Um, and we just, we turned all those projects over to, to Burleson, and I think it you know, was done a, a good job. So if we're at a point where people want to bid that out again, I think we were there, but we um, you know, kind of made that commitment at that time to let him represent the city um, position in these projects. Uh, they were being managed by staff people, either in the school system or whatever at that particular time. So it really kind of ratcheted up a notch, those projects, getting them completed on time, saving money. Um, and so I was very pleased with um, that decision that we made. So, and I think they've done a great job. Yeah, it's a lot like a lot like architects. You know, we have we have any number of very qualified folks to do our architectural work, our engineering work. Uh, I personally wouldn't mind seeing an RFQ. I mean, there are other firms, and uh, taking nothing away from the quality of. Of, of what Burleson has done, but uh, it does appear that we treat this service differently than others. Uh, to me, it looks it looks that way. So, I mean, if there's, I'm not going to make an issue of it unless, if I'm the only one, if there are two others who'd like to see what else is out there and maybe put it up for some sort of competitive bid, I'd be okay with that. Well, I'll take a turn. Um, I don't think it's that dissimilar from certain other professional services the city engage. We don't bid our audit annually, you know, look to BCS to do the audit, um, in part because there's a value qualitative to the nature of a professional service that bidding doesn't, you know, you're not necessarily chasing the low bid, and I know that's not what you're suggesting. I think I would kind of split the difference. We have a a critical need to deal with the Liberty Bell gym and cafeteria. One, because it has implications for the future uses of Freedom Hall, and two, just because there's desirability to put that facility back in a common campus where you aren't moving students across, you know, from one building to the other out in the open. I wouldn't want to see some decision we made now slow that project in any way. Having said that, I also don't want to sort of tacitly suggest that anytime we build anything, one person's going to be the only person who has an opportunity to manage that project. I, I've had occasion to interact with, with Burleson on other projects and other roles. I think they're very good. 
I think there would be value before we do it the next time to plan ahead to bring that, to, to put that out there to see what's out there. My suspicion is we would get less interest right now than we did in, was it 2000? 14 when we did it last because the the building the, the the number of open projects that a construction somebody with construction expertise could be involved in are far greater than they were at that time so that would I, I think it's valuable to ask the question I don't want to see it slow down this project because we need to move forward on Liberty Bell yeah, to, um, to Commissioner Wise's point I think there are two questions here one question is uh, whether or not we continue to utilize this firm for this project because the project needs to get moving or whether we place it back out for RFQs. And the second question is whether or not the process should be opened up, whether now or whether in the future. Um, I think it's important to open the process back up in the future. I think that others should have the opportunity to place their qualifications before us and have an opportunity to participate in some of what uh, what the government needs to have done for their fee. Um, we discussed this at the meeting on Monday evening, and, um, and I feel that even though I think it should be opened up, I feel that we need, to Commissioner Wise's point, we need to get moving on the Liberty Bell project. And so I backed off of, uh, off of my initial uh, comments which were that we open it up and and uh, indicated that I felt that at this point let's go ahead and retain Mr. Burleson for this project. I think he has done well for us in the past, but the next project that we have of this nature that we open it up for request for qualifications and give others the opportunity. Uh, to an earlier point that was made, um, we voted each project that Mr. Burleson was presented the opportunity to serve as construction management on individually. It was not a blanket every project we do that we need construction management, Burleson will get the opportunity to do it. Um, so I don't want that impression out there that in fact that was a, a, a blanket um, opportunity that was extended. Um, it it uh, ended up that he ended up being individually voted each of those projects, but um, but it could have been opened up to others. We'll go back to my point. The only reason I brought it up is the first time we've had one of these in the year and a few months that I've been on the commission, and I just didn't know what the procedure was because it looked like we just give it to them, and it's okay if that's the way it's always been, but it didn't seem like that's the way it's always been. Well, I think that was a very appropriate uh, question. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, I would like to see us open it up in the future when we have a little bit more time to be able to um, receive the request for qualifications, uh, look at them critically, and then get recommendation from staff about who might be the best person to, to award it to. What, what sort of delay on the project would it do, would, it, would, it, would we incur if we did? I mean, because there's an assumption well, the, that, it, the that project it would slow would, down. The, yeah. The final design of the project would be complete, and in all likelihood, the project would probably be started quicker than what we could get through an RFQ process and evaluate responses and, and have you all hire somebody. This, this project's scheduled to bid uh, end of May, 1st of June. You know, I think one of the things that's important for the public to understand, you weigh in here a little bit, just kind of give some indication about what value having project management brings to us. And it's not just value during the project itself, during the construction itself, it's prior to that as well. Yes, sir. Uh, and to follow up on another comment that you made, uh, this particular firm has not, all, does not serve on all of our projects. Uh, for example, we've done a number of projects in water sewer that involve buildings. They've never used him. Uh, you know, they've, they've never been involved in pipe projects or road projects or anything like that. We've used uh, other engineering firms. We've used, uh, at one time, we had an employee in-house in water sewer uh, that had the expertise to, to be the owner's representative. In answer to your question, the services this an owner's representative fulfills is to be involved during the design of the project, 
to kind of look over the shoulder of, of the design team to ensure that they're using best practices, that they're approaching the project to deliver what it is that the owner wants and to do it in a cost-effective way to, uh, to ensure that there's not a lot of waste or that there's alternative construction methods considered during the design process. And what this does is it prevents having to do a physical change order after the project has started. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, when you start doing change orders with a contractor after the contract started, you might get 30 or 40 cents on the dollar back out of your change order. <laughs> now, I'm not casting a bad light on the contractors, but they've made a lot of commitments at that point in terms of buying labor and bonds and insurance and materials, and they've got a work plan laid out there. And when you start changing it midstream, it costs them money, and you're never going to get your full dollar for dollar back on your change orders. It really minimizes the number of change orders we have. During the course of a construction project, and for any of you that's ever built a house, you know, you've got to pick colors, you've got to make decisions on a daily or a weekly basis about, well, the plans show this, but that's really not going to work. We can do it this different way and it will work. Or during the course of construction, uh, an owner's representative in, in in this case, in Burleson's case, them being a two, three generation long construction company, they're very familiar with construction techniques and methods and materials. Um, they, they are there to answer those questions for us. They're our QA, QC on the project. So it, it's invaluable to have somebody that goes to those projects on a very regular basis. And, and on big projects like this one we're talking about, Burleson uh, will assign someone to be there. They're usually on site every day, keeping weather logs, reviewing requests for change orders, they work in conjunction with the architects to make sure that the plans are being followed and there aren't any shortcuts taken. Um, so it's a great service. We've gotten great service from Burleson. And no matter if we do or we don't continue working with Burleson, it's imperative that we have an owner's representative on a project when we start getting into millions and, and multi-million dollar projects. It, it's it served us very well. Thank you. My assessment has been that it's been money, money well spent as well, but I appreciate you indicating to the public why we look at doing that. Yes, thank you. Very good. Any other comments? Uh, I just wanted to pull C2 real quick, and I apologize I didn't do it initially, and it's the Memorial Commissioner Mayor Jeff Banyas, uh, Edmund. <laughs> <laughs> I knew somebody surely would have to make, pull that. <laughs> make sure they pick up the trash amendment in that, Mr. Pizzola. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> any other uh, any other discussion? Would that be before or after they mow? Oh, preferably before. Okay. Because uh, when they do it afterwards, it's very difficult to pick up all those little tiny pieces. All right. <laughs> You need a motion to approve. Uh, only if we'd like to approve. I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Ms. Jennings, call the roll, please. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Van Brocklin. Yes. Commissioner Wise. Yes. Vice Mayor Brock. Yes. Mayor Tamita. Yes. Uh, next item on your agenda is the city manager's report. And as we talked, uh, I think two weeks ago, the uh, January financials were in your packet and I told you we would quickly review those this evening and I've asked Janet if she could uh, uh, give you a review of where we stand after our January financials to start the uh, report. Okay. Um, I'll start with the general fund and our two primary revenue generators are property tax and sales tax. Those collectively make up 64% of our general fund budget. Property taxes through January uh, collections were at 93% of what we billed in October, which was up from 91.5%.
collected at the same point last year, so we're very happy with, um, with our collection performance to date. The billings were up $412,000. Of course, we budgeted to be up, but we are even up $76,000 more than we budgeted. Our collections, even though I said our billings are up $412,000, our collections are up $861,000. And that is coming through in our 93% collection rate. Delinquent collections are up as well. Those are up $125,000 from last year. Uh, delinquent collections, keep in mind, those are kind of a one-time thing. Those are going to vary from year to year because the more you collect, I mean, once they're collected, they're collected. Um, so the, our, our aged receivables are continuing, continuing to go down. Um, now, as I get into the next section on sales taxes, keep in mind that I just said that our property tax billings were up $76,000 above what we budgeted. Sales taxes are down by about the same amount from what we budgeted year to date. So uh, that's going to be a swap through the first seven months. I did. Basically, Christmas was down? Uh, Christmas was down significantly. Um, I looked at details. I've not been able to ascertain the Internet. reasons for those. Um, we are getting sales taxes from online sales, but we do not get any detail on that. Of course, uh, out of state uh, taxes, out of state sales where Tennessee taxes are collected are apportioned back to us based on population. It doesn't matter if it was shipped here or not. So, so how does the state handle um, if someone buys online from here? Our sales tax rate is set nine and a half cents percent. Um, is the local option added to their purchase if they pay sales tax or is it just the state portion? They pay the nine and a half percent. We don't necessarily get that get back it. though. Okay. The state gets it and then doles but, it out by population. population. But how much is it being collected? Is every purchase now being collected? No. Sales tax. Okay. No. So that's the big differentiator there. Right. If there's a if they have a SADIS in the state, if they have a physical location in the state, um, they will collect it. However, but not if, out of state. Right. That's voluntary. So the only one we know that really collects it is Amazon that's out of state. Amazon actually has a site in the, in the state, okay. more than one. They have distribution centers inside the state. Now, what I understood from um, a conference I went to last week was that the um, local government in which they're located will benefit. The other thing about the Amazon sales, the items that are purchased from Amazon, Amazon's paying the sales tax on third-party vendors that sell things on Amazon are not paying sales tax right. to the state of Tennessee. Only Amazon is obligated. Right. A lot of, yeah, so a is lot it of fair that. to say that a very large portion of online sales occur outside of the state that we may not be getting any sales tax on? There's a possibility. Um, I've had numerous people ask me how much we're losing and I will tell you I did some research I've, I've had several people ask so I did some research I did some some pretty deep research what I found is that even the economic experts across the state and outside the state cannot nail that number down um, I suppose you could take a poll as people uh, come and go and you know like an exit poll uh, in political arena but you're you're just they're not able to nail that number down there was one significant study done by very highly revered experts a few years ago there were there was an outside 
company that specialized in, in these types of studies that also researched the matter and their information contradicted what the other expert reported. So the numbers are all over the place. You just cannot pin it down. We do know most likely we're losing some, we just don't know to what degree. So the message is, please shop local. Especially you young people in the audience, the, those of you who are left, yes, <laughs> stop ordering online. And, and your but, first, sometimes but you if you to. do, we'll understand. Yeah. The other thing to remember, by law, by law, you are required to pay sales tax on online sales. You are required to report that to the state of Tennessee. I would venture to guess that the vast majority of people in the state of Tennessee break the law on a regular basis when they make online purchases. I don't know that. But I would guess. I can, however, tell you from personal experience that you are open to being audited. <laughs> oh, yes, you sure. are open As to being audited. That's true. I am. Um, I, I certainly had a visit a couple of years ago from state officials to <laughs> see whether or not I was paying my share of sales online. tax on online purchases. What had you possibly done to attract <laughs> their attention? Did you buy that new <laughs> x-ray machine on, on Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> so, Ms. Jennings, one thing we can say for certain that when we don't collect sales tax with online sales, it affects the amount of money we have to go to education because Absolutely. we primarily fund our K through 12 schools through sales tax. And that's not simply at the local level. The state portion yep. of that is largely driven yep. through sales tax revenue as well. Uh, you know, I, I think the other thing that's pertinent, say uh, Janet indicated what she thought was, was important to note with this, uh, we have a congressman and we have senators who have not supported the Marketplace Fairness Act, which would cause online sales tax to be collected. And that's a great deficiency, in, in my opinion, for, for leaders for this state. In past years, the Senate has passed it. Where it gets hung up is in the House. In mid-April, the state, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear a case dealing with whether or not states may collect sales tax from online vendors who do not have a physical presence in their state. Uh, a decision is expected sometime in the summer, early fall. Uh, North Dakota. I think is the one that's taken the lead on this, and there are oh, 15 or 20 other, uh, I think they call them friends of the court, that have filed briefs in support of the North Dakota position that those taxes should be collected. So hopefully uh, a fair decision and a decision to enforce the laws of the states will be upheld and sales taxes will have to be collected. I mean, this, this is a I tell you what, I'll be happy to see relief from wherever it comes. Yeah. But yes. It's a shame it had to go the to the courts right. for that to yeah. occur. And yes. one more statement. There are companies here, like I'm not advertising, but I am, I guess, for Best Buy. But if you get a, a deal on Amazon online and you take that in, they will match the price if they have that in there at Best Buy. And you can buy it locally here and we still get the sales tax. So. There are companies that will do that here. Just, just uh, for the the viewing public, um, the two and a half percent local option sales tax does come back to us. Uh, that comes to us every month through through the state. Uh, we get that check every month. Half of it goes to schools and funds the educational programs in the schools, and half comes to the city to help build roads and uh, do the projects that are very much needed in the city, such as some of the projects that have been viewed tonight. So it is 24% of our general fund budget, so it's, it's vital uh, that we continue getting that and that we continue getting growth, not just uh, stagnant collections each year. Could you go over the year. number again on how, how much we're down on sales tax from budget? Uh, we're down $73,000 through seven months to budget. And 
we were up significantly through the November uh, collections. So it was Christmas. It was Christmas sales that were down about one hundred and eleven thousand um, dollars. And not to steal Janet's thunder, I hope this is where she's going. We're not unique. The state of Tennessee was way off in December and January as well. And I think I, uh, she's... I have an article. <laughs> January revenues less than expected. The Tennessee Department of Finance and Administration Commissioner announced overall January state tax revenues posted less than expected. Now, when they say January, they're probably, like I say December, they come in in the next month. Um, so they, they lag a bit. So they one, were significantly one right. final thing and not to beat a dead horse and we are beating it pretty good but i think <laughs> since we're talking about this we really should and this is to kind of key off something uh, commissioner fowler said our local businesses all have overheads pay property tax you know they have bricks and mortar they have inventory and you can go talk to many and most all of the owners here and they say you know we have people come in here try on our boots and then go home and order it online and so there's a there's there's a real cost to pay and we just uh, all learned this past week toys r us are closing down and one of their indicators and a part of why they made that decision they can't compete with amazon now because of the online sales so that's not all but that is one of the factors and so we're probably going to see more and more of this on the retail side that you know there's a big cost to having a physical presence in a community that they can't compete then with online when somebody's filling orders out of a garage. And there is more to be gained from the local business than the sales tax. The jobs they create, the support jobs that are required to support those jobs, the people that volunteer, whether in a civic club, a church, for a Jacobs Park project or whatever it may be, those people work somewhere local uh, you know, who makes donations to the United Way and to the Boys Club or the Animal Shelter or Girls Incorporated or whoever? Those are all people that work local. Amazon doesn't send any money in here for that. I mean, it, it's a much, much bigger loss than just the sales tax piece. We talk about the sales tax piece because that's money out of the government's pocket that we have to operate with. But a community-wide impact, it is much larger than just a sales tax base. Well, that's just been a stimulating blast of sunshine. <laughs> uh, Get my whip out here. <laughs> These young people, is it going to make you think any differently the next time you do this? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Um, the Economic Development Reserve that is part of the general fund is sitting at $1.9 million. You have funded some portions other things like the Mullican flooring um, contribution, some things like that that you have been utilizing those funds for, but that stands at $1.9 million. The 2% hotel occupancy tax, of course, that's been designated primarily for the UTSU Fine and Performing Arts Center Debt Service. Uh, that stands at $310,000. We still have debt payments coming in this year. We'll have about $50,000 a month in revenues that'll be coming in. So that's that's running close. I mean, it's it's on the right side uh, of the line. It's in the black, but um, it's running close. Our building type licenses, the gas permits and mechanical permits, those sorts of things that would indicate the level of uh, um, investment in the community as far as building, those are up $91,000. So. That's always a, a good thing to look at as an indicator for future tax revenues, property tax growth. Our expenditures, although they're up, they are in line with budget, very much in line with budget. So um, I don't see any concerns in the general fund at all right now. Um, the utility funds, they're pretty much in line with where they were last year. There are no significant variances on the utility funds. They're holding their own. They're all um, putting up, you know, nice gains and being able to reinvest in the infrastructure, water, sewer, stormwater, all those sorts of things. Uh, the health insurance fund continues to uh, to do well. It's down year to date. Um, however, that's on the school side, not on the city side. City side is doing quite well, and we still have very healthy 
reserves. We have about eight or nine months of reserves in the health insurance fund. So we can weather a few bad years on the health insurance fund. Um, if you have any other things, we're going to be moving the golf funds and you'll see more in coming months on that. We'll be moving those and, um, you know, carrying out the uh, actions that you've taken. So if you have any questions on anything else, we'll be happy to answer those questions. Thank you, Janet. Um, as Janet reported, I mean, we're, we continue to be in a strong financial position and certainly able to meet all of our obligations and grow the economy. While we are down $73,000 below budget on the sales tax portion, that does represent a two, probably a two and a quarter percent growth over last year. And we budget two and a half percent growth in sales tax. So we're we're still two percent growth, even though we're seventy three thousand dollars under budget. So it's it's not all that bleak. Uh, the re the other things I'd like to point out to you, and I just passed the report down to you uh, a minute ago. North Star will be in here on April twelfth to make a presentation on their work with the branding process. I would like to remind everybody that there is a uh, online survey that is a crucial piece to what we're doing with this branding process that can be found at brandjc.com. Uh, we would encourage everybody to get to take the survey if you haven't already done so. Uh, they're in, in the midst of gathering uh, information from which to develop the brand. Um, our ADA transition plan, our uh, contractor has begun work on that. They're in the process of gathering data and uh, doing evaluations to get us a plan back together. Uh, the City View software, if you, as you recall, that's the software we implemented back in uh, building and codes. Um, I think that's running really smooth now. I've talked to some of the local developers. They're, they seem to be very pleased with it and have reported that uh, from their perception that things are running much smoother with uh, engineering, water, sewer, building, planning, the, the whole uh, development group back there. Uh, as you know, the Kefauver Farm conversion is complete. Phil mentioned a little earlier, TDOT's got the Lark Street extension scheduled for a May bid letting, so hopefully we'll see construction start on that sometime this summer. You've got the copies of the two proposals from uh, the pro proposers for the Freedom Hall Management Services. We've asked them for some additional information, which we have uh, received. We're making some final reviews of that, and we'll be coming back to you at your next meeting on April the 5th with a recommendation on uh, either choosing one of the two proposals or rejecting both of them and doing something different, what, whatever direction you'd like to go. Uh, Buffalo Valley, as you're aware, that is closed. We did receive the one offer. Um, we do have a consultant reviewing uh, some potential other uh, uses out there uh, revolving about around using some of the property around the creek for a wetlands area. In addition, Charlie's been talking to some real estate folks about uh, how to proceed with uh, generating some additional uh, interest in the property. How close are we to uh, determining who we might utilize to market the property? I'm gonna have to call on Charlie, I, I don't know. Purchasing department has issued a request for qualifications for a professional real estate uh, brokerage firm. Those come back uh, April 6th. Um, new lighting's installed and operational at Cardinal Park. That, that's completed. Uh, Aerospace Park, uh, sent you an email the other day. The airport authority uh, has been recognized as issuing that debt under a AA quality. They issued the debt um, and uh, for the eight and a half million dollars that the locals have pledged. Our annual 
debt payment will be will average about one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars a year for twenty years that that covers our obligation to the aerospace park project uh, Thomas construction was awarded the uh, job to stabilize the bank up at Science Hill adjacent to the track in the baseball field. They're just waiting on the weather to break before they begin that project. Uh, that is uh, supposed to be finished prior to next football season. I know there's some track events that are scheduled up at the track. Uh, this shouldn't impact anything that's happening up at the track. We'll just have to uh, make sure that there's coordination if there are any events that are going to involve the throws area. I know ETSU uh, has got one outdoor event scheduled that will involve the throws area and, and we'll just have to coordinate with Coach Watts to make sure there's not any interference there. Um, the consultants with Walnut Street Quarter were in uh, this week had several meetings with them and they re came back with what they have come up with in terms of a concept plan, met with uh, staff and also met with the task force to report out what they had come up with and to take comments. Uh, they took the comments and have gone back to incorporate the comments into the concept and uh, they will be back up, commissioner wise, they will be back up in April I remember that right towards the end of April. Yeah, end of April. I don't remember the specific <coughs> date. Twenty eighth, maybe. That's that's yeah. what I was thinking too. Yes, sir. Um, so that's uh, that continues to move forward. That is another um, uh, big ticket item that we're going to have to take into consideration as we build next year's operating budget. There's there will be some shared expense there between. Uh, stormwater and the general fund uh, and water sewer because there, there will be some utility work involved in that as well as uh, Bright Ridge will have fairly significant uh, electrical piece. Um, the athletic fields, um, we made the presentation on the four field concept at the lakefront and based on the feedback that we've got, uh, you received that positively and we're trying to build budgets around making that happen in terms of what's happening with the Boone's Creek facility. The county has uh, budgeted $4.6 million for land acquisition and grading. They have obligated another $3.7 million towards the construction of those fields and they have agreed to pay for hiring a design professional to come in and get that project through schematic design and probable cost so that the city and the county both will know exactly what's being proposed and uh, the design professionals can tell us will it what we want will it fit will it work and here's what it's going to cost to build and that will allow both parties an opportunity to make a decision whether or not to move forward with with the project. Uh, Mayor Eldridge has asked that since our parks and rec folks have done this and he doesn't have anybody down there that, that's ever done a facility like this, if we would uh, speak to a couple of design professionals and get some proposals on doing this work and get a recommendation back to him sometime in April. So that's the timeline we're working off of. We've uh, got the proposal from Lowson Associates and there's uh, uh, CHA and uh, is, is the firm that did uh, Kermit Tipton Stadium. They did the DB Stadium, the Elizabethan Stadium, and they've done work from UCLA to the University of Florida and everything in between. We'll be in here to meet with me one day next week to look over the project and to put a proposal together. And there's another firm in Knoxville that we'll be talking to to get a proposal from. So. That's moving and, and I think it's moving in the right direction to get us the information we need to, to make a good decision. Um, the other things that are in there, the uh, new playground at Metro Aquinas Park is complete. Uh, the new playground at Carver, we have had some uh, significant issues with the vendor and the contractor. Uh, I think that got finished up this week and we will have a third party come in and do an inspection and ensure that everything 
meets specs and that it's safe and meets all the playground safety requirements. Uh, and hopefully in the next week, 10 days or so, we'll have a complete project there as well. And I would be glad to answer any other questions that you may have or take any direction. Looks, looks good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I believe that's the end of our agenda. That is the end of the agenda. Yes, sir. Unless you all would like to make, let us stretch it on for another 30 <laughs> minutes or so. Would you like to? Uh... I'd like to make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things. Right. Don't mind. <laughs> Go ahead. Go down the line. Uh, first of all, I want to appreciate uh, Commissioner Van Brocklin a couple of weeks ago giving some updates on the committees that he served. I just want to give you all an update on two or three things. Um, first of all, um, I think you've read in the paper and I've tried to communicate with you that we've had some issues out at the animal shelter with a, um, a series of dogs who, who contracted parvo. They've closed the shelter down. Um, they've gone to extensive and in-depth cleaning out there and looking at uh, a number of their procedures to make sure that um, you know, these kind of things are always going to happen at, in, at some point in time in a, in a shelter. And as large as the one we have now with the volume of uh, dogs and cats, um, it's going to happen. But they've done a stellar job there of really trying to turn that around. But the shelter will remain closed until I believe it's going to be the 28th next week, just to make sure that at, the, at our veterinarian's uh, recommendation that any of the viruses fully been sloughed off and, and they've got everything under control. Um, they are putting their budget together and um, they're going to request that the commission meet out at the shelter to review the budget and then to, uh, you know, have a tour of the building and some of the things that they're looking at. So um, we'll just kind of keep that until I, I guess you'll be giving them more of a time frame um, when that will occur, but just kind of wanted to let you know that. Um, <coughs> A couple of other uh, committees I serve on is the Outdoor Task Force, which is really gaining some traction, and that's gaining traction you know, throughout the region. Um, they are sponsoring a very major outdoor festival here in the summer. Uh, the base camp will be at Founders Park, but there will be out stations of different kinds of events uh, throughout the region to get people out to, so we anticipate thousands of people coming into town for that. Um, on Tannery Knobs, uh, I will tell you the task force met a couple of weeks ago. Um, they would like to target somewhere in the early June time frame for, a, for a, an official opening. But of course, that means several things have to happen up to that point in time, uh, such as uh, an MOU with uh, Sorba and Imba. Um, and uh, transfer of the property. Uh, so I think a series of meetings uh, Mr. Stahl's going to be leading um, is working with them to get uh, that all under wraps. Um, we also have gotten indication uh, we applied for a grant for some additional development up at Tannery Knobs and it looks like it's going to be received somewhere in the $80,000 range that will be applied to the pump track and skills area on the very top of the mountain there, which will make uh, the bike park a very, very unique feature. And that's where a lot of the instruction will take place with our young people and old people who've never ridden a mountain bike and want to go up and learn. So they can work on the skills and pump track and then go off on the trail. So um, uh, we're excited about that. Um, Lastly, and uh, you were indicating something else with ETSU, but um, uh, the Olympic training program, and I never can say the big name, but you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> On May 26, we'll be at um, Kermit Tipton Stadium, and the, the U.S. Olympic uh, Training, uh, the U.S. Olympic Committee has asked them to hold um, um, an evaluation process for people who think they are they could be an Olympic athlete. So it's going to be a pretty big deal. So if you there you go. There's your chance. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Curling. That, Curling. They will You're be evaluating, <laughs> I think, for five different sports and or eight Steeper. different sports using five different evaluation or vice versa there. So uh, they've asked for city support just from getting the facilities and Parks and Rec helping with, you know, some of the stuff up there. And we're also going to 
we were pulling the committee together <laughs> on Friday morning to That's look at just the public relations school. side of it because it could be a pretty big deal. So those are my committees I sit on. The last thing I would like to say, I know our fire and police have been really, um, it, it, we've had some, some unusual things happen in our community in the last couple of weeks. And I know our fire and police have really been called into action. And so, uh, Mr. Peterson, if you could relate our thanks. And I know they have been extremely professional in, in all of that. And uh, I loved it in the paper yesterday when they said in the, and so the, while the firemen were waiting for something to happen, they helped stack the wood from that truck that overturned. So they went beyond the call. But anyway, if you would uh, yes, tell Chief Staples, and I see Chief Turner there, we, we thank them greatly. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else? I'll call this meeting adjourned. So we'll be over to 2014 to 19.